Okay, so in the last uh, two lectures, we went through uh, 1 over n in some detail. And then uh, we spent a lecture reviewing the original arguments behind ADS CFT. In this one, I would like to come back to something which we talked about in the first one, actually before 1 over n, when we did an overview of gauge theory and that's the computation of the Wilson loop. So now that we have a duality between uh, gauge fields and strings, we should use it for something. And this is one of the uses that has found some level of success. By success, I mean there is a particular kind of Wilson loop in a particular scenario, in a particular gauge field theory which is actually computable uh, both perturbatively and on the string side. And in fact, many variants of this idea have been uh, worked out. So there's lots of things that are computable on both sides. Most of them match. I probably will not talk about the things that don't match. And that's because I would say they're not really well understood. Of course, they are the most interesting things because, well, there are two possibilities. Either the whole thing is wrong for some subtle reason or the technology to do the computation ha uh, uh, has some, something has been missed somewhere. So uh, there are those things. Uh, I will not go there. Instead, I'd like to give a kind of a physics-y overview of the Wilson loop to try and explain as best I can uh, how and why or why and how you do the computations you do to find it. Okay, so we had at some uh, point this expression. Well, in the gauge field theory, this was the expectation value in the gauge theory. of the exponential of the line integral of the connection. We will modify this expression in a short while because this is not exactly what we compute. But this was on the wish list of what one would compute in a gauge field theory. And then there was the string theory conjecture. that this could be written as a sum over topologies of uh, world sheets. And then a sum, generalized sum of some kind, over disks, which are called xi, such that the boundary of the disk is the contour in the Wilson loop. And then some measure factor, which might depend on the disk, and on the topology. And then a Boltzmann factor, which should be something like e to the minus a string tension times the area of the disk. Right, so that was the wish list, the hypothetical model. And here we will see more or less an explicit example of this, although we will never do some of the steps here. We will never really do this summation. We will concentrate on the simplest topologies, which we can do by adjusting the string sling constant. And this sum we will also only really ever evaluate semi-classically. And why is that? Well, to do better, better than that, you have to actually solve string theory, and that turns out to be hard. That turns out to be actually harder than solving the gauge theory. So we can talk about it semi-classically and at weak string coupling. That turns out to be not too hard. Answers are readily available there. But to really do this is still an open problem. To really do this beyond the classical limit uh, is still a subject of ongoing research. So. Uh, 
So in some ways the news here is good, and in some ways there are still challenges. Okay, so let me come back to n equals four Yang Mills and set up a set up a physical scenario. Physical in quotes because this is not a realistic gauge theory. It doesn't really describe anything in nature, but it is a quantum field theory. So in the context of that quantum field theory, at least let me try to set up a scenario where one would want to compute a Wilson loop. So a Wilson loop for some object. Uh, and this scenario is a scenario that can be carried over to the string side and computation done there. Okay, so n equals 4 super Yang Mills. Well, first of all, it's a conformal field theory. So one has to find something to compute a Wilson loop for. Now, Wilson loop physically is something like part of an amplitude or a propagator of some heavy particle. You use the Wilson loop without worrying about kinematics of the particle that the Wilson loop is a holonomy for, in a sense because the particle is so heavy when it emits and reabsorbs uh, gauge field quanta, it doesn't recoil. So we have to find a heavy particle here, first of all. Otherwise, uh, we don't really have uh, anything to compute. So let me uh, remind what the Lagrangian looks like. Well, the beginning of the Lagrangian. I will, if it's needed, come back and talk more about n equals 4, but let me be as, uh, as minimally technical as I can be. Uh, also, let me write it in Euclidean space. So there's a trace outside of here. I might as well take it outside along with the integral because every degree of freedom is matrix valued. So in Euclidean space, I can uh, write a mu squared like this, and it has a plus a half in front of it. So this piece is generic Yang-Mills theory like we have talked about. Then there's a bunch of scalar fields. which are real scalar fields. Normally, a real scalar field would have a half in front of its kinetic term. But here I have this funny normalization where a factor of a half is missing here. And so it also has to be missing here to have the correct normalization. And then the scalars interact through a commutator term. That looks something like that. The minus sign is, of course, because a commutator of Hermitian matrices is anti-Hermitian. And so this is Euclidean space. Everything should be positive. So, so the square of an anti-Hermitian matrix is a positive object. And this is summed over pairs of indices, I and J, like so. And this is the bosonic content of the theory. Then there's a bunch of fermions. Since we don't really need them now, I won't introduce them yet. But they're there to complete uh, the supermultiplet and to make this theory supersymmetric. And in fact, it's maximally supersymmetric, as supersymmetric as a four dimensional gauge theory can be. Here, the index i that appears on the phi goes from one up to six. So there are six scalar fields, phi and the gauge field are n by n Hermitian matrices. The proper gauge group here should be SUN, not really UN, but if we pretend it's UN, it's not going to change things very much. And that's because all of the interactions here are by commutator. 
So for example, d mu of phi, phi is uh, the covariant derivative of phi. But since phi is matrix valued, that covariant derivative <coughs> needs a commutator with the gauge field. And because of this, if there were a U1 part, if phi were not a traceless matrix, but a matrix with a trace, which means it sits in a Lie algebra of UN instead of SUN, and similarly for A mu, they decouple anyway. The U1 part is just free field theory. And so dynamically, there's really no difference between SUN and UN. And of course, UN has a much nicer large N limit, so we typically use it. In other words, the U1 part of the UN just decouples like free field theory. And if you really wanted to know what it is, you could figure it out and uh, take it into account in our large N calculations. So we pretend it's UN, and uh, that turns out to be OK. All right. This Lagrangian has a rather interesting structure in that if you look for low energy classical solutions of it, there's sort of one obvious kind. It has a Higgs like potential, right, a phi 4 potential in this funny commutator form. And of course, the first thing you do when you quantize a gauge theory with some scalar fields is you want to look for minima of the potential. That's where you should start the quantization procedure. Right? If, the, it wasn't, if phi equals zero were not a minimum of the potential, you would shift phi and, uh, uh, by some constant in order to minimize the potential, and then you would start quantizing there. Well, here phi equals zero is a minimum, but actually this minimum is quite degenerate. There's a large degree of degeneracy How is it degenerate? Well, any field configurations phi which commute with each other, in a sense, give zero potential energy there, just like phi equals zero would. So there are a whole bunch of degenerate minima. And we'll take advantage of that here. To translate phi by a constant, to say, uh, give one of these phi's a constant condensate and let the rest be zero. That's still a zero of that potential because the potential is all commutators. And so all the other phi's being zero trivially commute with the phi that isn't zero. And let's see, maybe it's phi six I will give a condensate to. Now, such condensate is. Uh, well, like I've argued, a minimum of the potential, you can go out along it, then the potential remains zero. That zero actually turns out to be protected by supersymmetry. So even when you quantize, for example, the vacuum energy of this highly supersymmetric field theory is zero. Even when you quantize and allow a condensate like this, the vacuum energy remains zero. In other words, it did depend on the value of the condensate. And that's uh, due to supersymmetry, really the superconformal invariance of the original theory, and the fact that some of the supersymmetry remains unbroken, in fact enough of it, about half of the supersymmetries when the condensate appears, uh, in order to, to uh, protect the uh, in a sense the expectation value of phi from uh, renormalization. Okay, now phi is an n by n matrix. So giving it an expectation value means you have an expectation value of something which transforms under the gauge transformations. When that happens, you should have a Higgs mechanism. Right? It's something like in the standard model. The standard model expectation value is charged under some of the, the SU2. Uh, 
and having an expectation value the Higgs mechanism. In fact, what I'd like to do is in a sense select the expectation value to have a minimal Higgs mechanism. So at this point there's lots of things one could do, uh, but let's just do the minimal one. Uh, let's say the gauge group instead of being un was u n plus 1. That's because I'm going to Higgs it back down to un and it's just easier to use un all the time since that will be what's left over. Then let's assume that this condensate as an n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix only has one non-zero entry. And that's the one way down in this corner. So everything else in this matrix is zero. This kind of condensate will Higgs the un plus 1 symmetry down to un cross u1. Okay, the un will remain the gauge group of all the massless stuff. So there's a whole sector of n by n matrices that are basically to a leading order unaffected by this condensate. And they will be like un n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. Then there's a u1 part. So some u1 gauge field and things that are charged under this u1. <coughs> and then in this theory, there's going to be a bunch of bi-fundamental stuff. In fact, the the uh, field content goes something like this. Yes. Yeah, it does. So this will have a direct analogy on the brain side, which uh, I will get to as soon as I say a few more things here. Okay. No, 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 no. Actually, let me say it now, then, since, since it is an issue and you ask about it. On the D-brain side, what is the analog of doing this, making this condensate? Well, remember at the beginning of our discussion of ADS CFT, we had a stack of D3 brains. A stack of D3 brains was coincident. They sat right on top of each other, infinite, flat, and so on, uh, with world volumes that are basically four dimensional Minkowski space. To do this, what we do is we take one of the D3 brains and move it away from the rest, like this. So we simply take one and translate it some distance over. Then you can see how the Higgs mechanism is going to work in pictures over here, because the n equals 4 gauge fields were strings that do this. But now there are also strings that go from here over to here. These strings necessarily have a length. In the open string theory that describes them, they're going to be massive particles. In fact, the lowest energy states of these strings are going to be W bosons. Whereas these are going to be the UN gauge group n equals 4 fields that are left over. And then there's some u1 fields. Those are the strings that do this. So these are u1, basically an abelian gauge field that uh, lives over here. OK, so on the gauge theory side, this is what we're doing. On the string theory side, it's this. Of course, this is the weak coupling picture. I will have to translate it to the strong coupling picture. 
but it will be a lot like that anyway over there. Pardon? Yeah, I'd rather not get into that. Uh, uh, I guess I was around in that era. Well, maybe not. <laughs> That's really a long time ago. Uh, Kibble was one of the important people at the beginning, it's true. Higgs, Kibble, Goralnik, uh, et cetera. There's a, there's a list of people who contributed. And uh, not having really worked through the original papers, I'm not really ready to say who did what. Uh, but the D brain one isn't due to Kibble. <laughs> that, that came later. In fact, I don't even know who it's due to. Uh, I want phi to have an expectation value in the vacuum. To make it plausible, you can see that one of these phi's has an expectation value. This is a commutator only of phi's with different phi's. So if the rest are zero, the condensate of one of these is still a zero with a potential. And that's if the gauge fields are zero, the classical gauge fields, and the phi is a constant. The potential is flat in this direction. So the potential of n equals 4 at the classical level is flat. Actually, it turns out to be flat at the quantum level, too. Okay, so there are just flat directions, and we're taking advantage of one of them to make a condensate. And the reason why I want to make that condensate, there's really only, uh, well, there's two reasons. One is to make something that's massive. So here there will be W bosons. And in fact, there's a whole W boson supermultiplet because they're half BPS objects. And the mass turns out to be tunable. You can just set it to whatever you want. Well, it's kind of obvious. You had a scale invariant theory and you introduce a condensate. There's only one dimensional parameter doesn't really matter what that parameter is. It's the same theory. Right? The only difference is whether it's zero or not. So you have a tunable mass. And that mass has something to do with the minimum length of this string. Okay, and in fact, you have a whole supermultiplet. You have 256 of these fields. Uh, that if you take one of them are created uh, by operating supercharges. So they commute with half of the superchargers. The other half, uh, as you make commutators, generate a whole multiplet. And there are 256 kinds of W bosons here. And they include vectors and scalars. And that's nice because we can take a scalar W boson and we don't have to worry about all the details of looking after its spin. Okay, there was a question here. Yes? So basically, the the Yes, exactly. And for the brains, we'll also, I'll also argue this is a flat direction. Okay, so over here you should be quantizing the string, something you learned all about in other lectures, so I'll give no details whatsoever. But in this highly supersymmetric scenario, this should also be a flat direction. What does that mean? It means there's no potential, no attraction or repulsion between this brain and the stack. Right? The potential is absolutely flat, so this brain will just sit wherever you put it. It won't be pulled back. It won't be pushed away. Uh, that looks a little weird because you'd think the zero point energy of these things would pull them back together. But remember, this is a super multiplet with fermions and bosons, and actually the zero point energies between all those things cancel. 
And that's, in a sense, why this direction is flat. OK, I'm just looking at what I need from this. <coughs> All right, so this is the scenario I'm interested in. And then what I would like to look at is, say, the propagator for a W boson, the amplitude that it starts somewhere and goes somewhere. And that will make liberal use of the large n limit because that simplifies the problem. And of course, this W boson is propagating in the background of n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory, all the massless stuff that's left over. <coughs> the W boson is actually charged. In fact, I should write that down. So, A, the original gauge field, has a matrix, the n plus 1 component to any other component. is a W boson, and the A to N plus 1 is W bar. It's a complex vector field, right? Just like the W in the standard model, is W plus, W minus. So you can think of this as the W plus, and this dagger is a W minus. And it's got one index under the UN that transforms under the residual UN gauge group. So this field is actually in the fundamental representation of the gauge group. Right, it's a vector uh, with these indices that go now one to n, right? Whereas before, in in the bulk Yang mills, all of the fields were matrices. So this is something new, and the fact that it's a vector will help us a lot because in large n, it's got only n, not n squared components, and that uh, that in fact allows us to control what it does. In fact, the technical statement is that fundamental representation fields are quenched. What does that mean? Well, if you take them into account in the vacuum energy, they contribute terms of order n, not n squared, like the other ones do. So they're less important. If you just take the large n limit and neglect stuff of order n, and only keep stuff of order n squared, you basically throw away all the loops of these things. And then when you calculate an amplitude, something similar happens. It allows you to throw away internal loops with W bosons, if you really look at large n, and just keep the internal lines that you have to keep to make the amplitude that you want. So for example, the amp propagator for a W boson at large n, In Feynman diagrams, we'll have the W boson line threading through it. It has to come in and it has to go out because the U1 charge that it carries is conserved. But you don't need any other ones. All the other ones are suppressed in the large end limit. And so it simply interacts with the other matrix valued gauge fields. Those aren't suppressed. There's an infinite sum of planar Feynman diagrams that uh, uh, would compute this interaction, but the W bosons you don't need. So a propagator or an amplitude for a W boson to travel somewhere, you might write like this. Since you only need one line, it's a very useful way to write it is, uh, is uh, using the world line path integral. In the world line path integral, you integrate over trajectories. You integrate over proper time the so-called Schwinger proper time, and then you have uh, action here, which, sorry, I won't write 
I'll write it explicitly just in here, uh, which has the Schwinger proper time and the trajectory in it, and looks something like this. Well, this is a free propagator. So this path integral you can integrate explicitly. It's Gaussian and x. Just do that integral, and then it's some integral over t. And you can see it's just some proper time representation of the actual propagator. The measure here has some factors of t in it, which actually depend on how you regularize things here, how you, uh, say, uh, define the determinant of d by d tau squared up here. Uh, but they can be adjusted, so you get back the actual propagator. So there's a doubly boson uh, propagating without interacting with anything. How do we take into account the interactions? Well, we stick back in the Wilson loop. This basically means that... Uh, this thing, of course, is the expectation value in the residual gauge theory of this path trace of this path ordered phase. Okay, something like that. Actually, I should write it where I have more space because I, I need to elaborate it a little bit since this, this Wilson loop is a bit of a special one. Now, of course, I am having a space issue here. Let me come back over here. Uh, So I don't need any more lines of doubly bosons here. And I can forget about all the doubly bosons in here too, simply because here I'm doing large n. And anything with a doubly boson loop is going to be suppressed at large n compared to the other stuff that doesn't have a doubly boson loop in it. So I get away with one line, which I've written in Euclidean space here. And then this thing. And what is this thing? Well, it's the expectation value in the n equals 4 theory, the massless residual one with the un gauge symmetry. Trace of path ordered e to the i, integral d tau, x mu dot of tau, a mu of x of tau, That's the first stuff that's upstairs. But actually, this also couples to the scalar field of n equals 4. And it couples to the scalar field in the direction, which I guess is easiest to see from here, in the direction which pulls on the brain this way. So the gauge fields, you can think of as, as fluctuations of geometry, in a sense, of the brain in this direction, and the scalar fields in this direction. And there's one scalar field which uh, tells you about the distance between those. And that was what we called phi 6. And that appears in this Euclidean exponent without an i in front. And the scalar field is not line integrated like this. It actually is integrated against the length of the curve, so it appears something like this. Uh, five, six of x of tau. And then this expectation value was taken in the in the UN super Yang Mills theory that's left over. So it means these doubly bosons don't back react much on the state of what's left, at least at large n because of this quenching. And here we have a Wilson loop. 
why the Oh, why the Wilson loop? Well, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So this is something that's important to understand. How would you couple, a, say, a background U1 field? Say you didn't know about this. You have a propagator. How would you put a U1 field here? How would you take into account the Lorentz force? of say an electric or magnetic field on the charged particle. You'd add this, right? You'd add I integral along the trajectory right, of the U1 gauge field. That's what you'd do. Right? If it were a charged particle and you were doing uh, electrodynamics, in fact, if you're doing classical electrodynamics, forget about quantum, so just take this as a classical action. Right? The way you would couple an electromagnetic field is by adding this term to the action, and this term gives you the Lorentz force on the particle. Right? If you do the variational principle, it uh, gives you the relativistic expression for the Lorentz force, which will, of course, modify the trajectory of the particle somehow. And in fact, we'll make use of this because we might want to push our particle around. So maybe we want to put an electric or magnetic field in to push the particle around to make it do something. You know, we'll, we'll like to compute the circle Wilson loop. So it would be natural to put a magnetic field here to force the particle to move in a circle. And then this other Wilson loop will automatically be the circle Wilson loop. So, so this we can take into account here. But what if there are other gauge fields besides the U1 gauge field? How do you couple them? Well, the appropriate way is to put in here the path ordered phase for these other gauge fields. And then there's some quantized fields, whereas we just have a quantum particle there. So how do quantized fields act with the, interact with the quantum particle? Well, you have to take this expectation value. The gauge fields are back, or the particle will back react on the gauge fields because this provides some kind of a source in the gauge theory, right, for this bracket, whatever defines this bracket, this is a source that adds something to the dynamics there. And this expectation value is a functional of the trajectory of the particle, so it puts some kind of force on the particle, some analog sort of non-abelian analog of a Lorentz force. Okay, so this is, this is the right way to take into account these effective gauge fields on a particle. Right, this is sort of moving through the, the massless gauge field medium, and then there's the U1 field up here. And this is just the residual U1 of the UN cross U1 would couple exactly this way. Okay, its coupling is suppressed by 1 over n unless you make the fields really strong, actually. Right? The U1 gauge field compared to a UN gauge field is going to have no effect unless the magnitude of the field is unusually big, like order n, maybe order root n. I don't remember, but it's some. Uh, but uh, you could do it in principle, you know, put a really strong magnetic field and make, make the particle do what you want. Phi to the power 6? No. <laughs> it's the sixth component of phi. Yeah. It's the one that was condensing. Why is it here? There is a hand-waving argument, which is the one that I gave which simply looks here and says that this W boson will pull on the brain a little bit that way, and so will excite phi 6, which is the fluctuations of the stack of brains in, in this direction. Okay, so it'll back react on, so in a sense, phi 6 is important for what the W boson does and vice versa. But there's a more technical explanation in that if you go to the n equals 4 Lagrangian and expand around the condensate, you get some wave operators for the W boson. 
and this phi 6 appears in there. And then if you do the, the usual random walk representation of the determinants for them, the phi 6 does appear in, the, in basically the same place as the gauge fields do. Okay, so that's just technical, but it turns out to be that way. And then in Euclidean space, the phi 6 actually loses its factor of i. Right. When you go to a Euclidean space, this i stays here. I guess it's because it's i d tau d by d tau, so somehow the i's from analytic continuation of time cancel out in here. So the i stays when you go to Euclidean here, but mm, not here. It becomes something. In other words, this is no longer really holonomy because it has a piece that isn't unitary. Right? It's something more complicated. But anyway, it's needed there, and in fact, it it will have it'll play a rather nice role one can see that it has something to do with the supersymmetry and the protection of the w boson mass for example uh, from getting radiative corrections uh, protection due to supersymmetry is somehow encoded in the appearance of this thing here it makes the wilson loop a much nicer object That's true. <laughs> That's true. In fact, you can see that too. That's right. You're perfectly right. Coming from 10 dimensions, this was just a gauge field. So if somehow you embed this in 10 dimensions, there are these other gauge fields, and this is somehow the one that couples to, to, the, to the particle that we want. What is more, if you make the d-brains by t-duality, the way you change the vertex operator into t-duality actually gets rid of this factor of i and puts this thing here. So it, uh, there, there is a reasoning from that direction for exactly why you use this operator. If you think of this as a vertex operator, I don't know, for the gauge field coupling here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Let's do a semi-classical calculation here. So actually, you can compute this exactly almost. Well, not really. There's this terrible functional of x here. Right? Terrible, completely unknown functional of x. Right? You have to take this expectation value. It depends on the trajectory in a complicated way. And we really don't have much hope of unraveling it. We might perturbatively. We might non-perturbatively, but in general, it's complicated. All right, but in any case, uh, let's start with uh, at least a rough estimate of what this propagator should look like. So we'll assume the mass is heavy. That's what, uh, that's what gives uh, the semi-classical limit here. And for the moment, ignore the possibility of a gauge field coupling this way and ignore this. So what's the semi-classical limit of just this first path integral where you forget about this guy and forget about this guy. So we'll take that limit and then we'll fix it up a little bit. So to find the semi-classical limit, you just find the classical equations of motion for this action. So those are something like minus x mu double dot over 2t equals 0, the one classical equation of motion. And the other one is for this parameter t, which doesn't depend on tau. Right? It's just the total proper time. Uh, I think this is a gauge-fixed version of, uh, of uh, something that Nathan was talking about maybe yesterday. The, anyway, it, is, it just depends on proper time. And its equation is something like t squared is 1 over 4 m squared integral of x dot squared. Okay, so there's the equations that you want to solve. That's pretty easy. This has a solution something like x mu of tau is something with a constant velocity, say x final minus x initial mu tau over the whole time range 
and then plus a constant, which is maybe the initial position. Okay, so I'm assuming that the particle goes from an initial position, x initial, to a final position, x final, in some interval of time, big T. And tau runs from zero up to that big T. Of course, I didn't say what it runs over here, but you can make it over, run over various intervals just by scaling the time and the other variables in here. So there's a classical solution for you, and then this equation tells you that this, well, I can see right away I've got too many big T's here. Uh, uh, uh. Let me rename this big T something like tau P proper time, which it might turn out, might even turn out to be. Otherwise, I have too many big T's. It means I have to remember to things in my notes all the time, but uh, let's not worry too much about that. So here, uh, if you plug in what this is, you get this, this big T, the Schwinger proper time, is 1 over 4m. This is x dot squared, so that strips off this tau, makes the square of this, x final minus x initial squared, uh, divided by tau p squared, times tau p, so there's one tau p downstairs. Is it wrong? <laughs> yes? Yes? Yeah. 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 Yeah, going from an initial point, say, to a final point. I'm a little bit vague about this because it's not really going to matter very much. <laughs> but uh, but you can define it precisely that way. Going from initial point to a final point, this thing without anything uh, could be the two-point function for a scalar field. So here we've chosen the scalar member of the W boson supermultiplet. This should be the W boson mass. There's no spin, so we could do spin if we want, but we don't want. Yeah. The T? Yeah. Schwinger proper time. This is Schwinger proper time. So uh, this this T, right? Yeah. That's Schwinger proper time. Uh, it's very easy to derive this. Yeah, it's like the gauge fixed Einbein. But actually, I like the derivation better where you just derive it this way. Then you can put in an Einbein if you like to have a, to have a reparameterization invariant formalism. And this is like that thing with the reparameterization invariance fixed. I think I won't derive it in front of your eyes here, but it's very easy to derive this form. Just take the two-point function in momentum space use a Schwinger formula, and you can show that this path integral reproduces it if you choose the appropriate uh, measure here, which depends on regularization, but can all be done. In fact, with zeta function regularization, it works out beautifully. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a two-point function of a scalar field, free scalar field. Right, then we dress it up a bit with these things. But here we've ignored those things and are just looking for a semi-classical solution. So if you plug all of this in, what this goes like, e to the minus the mass of the particle times the square root, basically the distance it travels, x final minus x initial squared square root. So in the leading semi-classical approximation, it comes out to, well, exactly what you might have expected. e to the minus mass times what you could interpret as the proper time over which the particle uh, propagated. Okay, now can we improve this? Well, I won't impose an external field from here. And even if this fluctuates, it's negligible at large n compared to what this will do. But we should take into account what this will do. 
That turns out to be kind of easy in the semi-classical approach, because how do we take this into account? Well, it adds a force to our particle. That force would be taken into account here by, I'm not going to erase there, I'm going to write another equation, for those of you who take notes, would be taken into account here by just modifying this equation by a forcing term. which is like that. That would be your new semi-classical equation. Well, that puts a force there, which is something terrible, and uh, not so. we'll never know exactly what the force is because it's beyond our computational powers to actually compute this functional. So this is reminiscent of uh, one of the loop equations in Yang-Mills theory, a little bit simpler, but still reminiscent of that. But we can make the following observation that just comes from symmetry. d by dx mu of this thing, of w, when evaluated on the straight line, which is what we have this solution here, straight, is actually, well, effectively equal to zero. And that's just by symmetry. The d by dx is in directions other than the direction of the straight line. It's zero by symmetry, just rotation and variance about the straight line. Along the direction of the straight line, it's not so obvious. You need some scaling symmetry and perhaps a reparameterization to see it there. But given that fact, then actually down here we found an exact solution of this equation. So semi-classically we've still found the correct classical solution. It is just the straight line that we were talking about uh, so far. And then we could put in the corrections here in the semi-classical limit by computing the Wilson loop for a straight line. Right? That, that would, that would uh, correct this limit. So now I would like to put W for our straight line. And that I could put in perturbatively, say, by simply going and doing a perturbative calculation. Right now, this Wilson line is the line integral along the trajectory, which is just a line. Actually, here it's a finite line, and you might think there are then gauge invariance issues, right? Because the Wilson loop should really be a loop to be gauge invariant, or maybe an infinite line, and then you only do gauge transformations that are trivial at infinity. And that's true. So here there's some gauge issues. And probably what happens is we can only really trust the asymptotics here as this proper time goes infinite. Right? So there is that subtlety, which I have brushed over, of course. But we'll assume our straight line is infinite. And then this is sensible. So we can improve this by calculating the Wilson loop for a straight line. And that is something well-defined to go to the gauge theory and do. So before we take a break, let's just do it. So I'm working at large n here. That's what allowed things to become even this simple. But even at large n, there is still a coupling constant, the Tuft coupling lambda. Uh, 
And when it's weak, I can rely on Feynman diagrams. So let's assume that lambda is small. Then I can simply Taylor expand this exponential to some powers in A and use the propagators of the n equals 4 theory, the AA propagator, the phi phi propagator, to actually get a functional of x mu here. Now I have to remember how many factors of pi there are. Detail one, detail two. I don't have space here, so I'll write it down here. This is in Euclidean space, of course, so I don't need any I epsilons. The integrand looks something like this. And this is to leading order, and then there's higher orders, like that. And this is, uh, of course, I've chosen a gauge. Can't do the calculation without choosing a gauge. So here I'm in the Feynman gauge. In that action I wrote two days ago, uh, for Yang Mills theory, that's with that parameter xi equal to 1. There's the Feynman gauge. Uh, okay, and then that affects, of course, this, which is comes from the vector field, vector vector correlator. It just then gives a dot product between the tangents uh, to the trajectory. The scalar field contributes this part. You can sort of see what's happening. This is a self-energy of the particle. The particle attracts itself by exchanging a scalar field, emitting and reabsorbing a scalar field, and it repels itself by emitting and reabsorbing a gauge field. Right? In a way, it's a charged particle, and it's the same charge as itself, so it repels itself. But scalar Scalar interactions are attractive. They're Yukawa type of interactions at this order, universally attractive. And so here you see a balance between attraction and repulsion. For a straight line, these are actually equal. To see that, simply write down the straight line trajectory. is equal to some constant here. Well, take the trajectory we had, x final minus x initial, mu, tau over some total proper time plus the uh, initial time. x dot is just in a given direction. If you plug this in here, you will find that this actually cancels this exactly because these are tau independent, so they're just all the same vector. Dot product of a vector with itself is equal to the modulus of that dot product squared, so the numerator just cancels. So there's some cancellation between the propagator, uh, between the scalar mediated interaction and the vector mediated interaction. And in fact, that's true for many, many diagrams. So this, actually, for this Wilson loop, is simply this correction, where this you could think of as a scalar plus vector line, two of them, an effective line. But this then tells you that everything of this form is equal to zero because, well, one of them is zero. They're all zero. So many, many diagrams are just zero. And the conjecture is that 
Well, they're probably all zero. So the things that aren't included in this list are diagrams with uh, internal vertices and interactions and so on. The idea is that by supersymmetry, those things are actually zero. That's been checked to a few orders, actually, and, and it works. I don't know of an actual proof that all of these go away. The localization, which you'll hear about next week, I believe isn't a proof because these infinite straight lines don't fit on the four sphere. Right, so that's a proof for a different kind of Wilson loop. Uh, uh, for the circle, which we can talk about after we take a break. Uh, but for a straight line, the conjecture is they all go away. So we'll take a break and we'll come back and revisit this problem on the strong coupling side and take a, just take a look at what this simple uh, semi-classical problem looks like over there. Okay, so let's come back in uh, five or ten minutes. So there's all kinds of indices here. Let me put them all just to get everything right. This thing is equal to 1 over 4 pi squared, 1 over x minus y squared in Euclidean space. It's like this. There's a delta mu nu, and then delta a d delta b c. So I've used this expression for the a a piece here they go from here down to here, and the AA term is the second one. You see the delta mu nu couples the tangents to the curve that the A's are integrated against. And so thus this dot product here, tau 1 for one of the A's, tau 2 for the other one. And then it's the same story for the scalar. The scalar propagator is exactly like this, except it doesn't have the mu new indices. Instead, it has the i and j, the different species of the scalar indices. But otherwise, it's identical. In here, it couples to the length of the curve. That's this and this at tau 1 and tau 2. Okay, the denominator comes from this piece. Then there's these things. These things you can see how to take into account, well, by basically drawing a fat graph. So fat graph has this line that we're integrating over, that these integrals go over. The initial and the final point that's being integrated and looks something like this. Okay, so there's the, so this double line is the vector field or the scalar field that's being exchanged. It's a matrix field. The W boson it's interacting with has only one line and you can think of it as being routed like this. And there's a factor of n. You can see taking the trace will give a, an additional factor of n. Of course, the trace outside joins this end with this end, so there's an n squared. So the leading term here has an n. The second term will have an n squared, but g yang mills squared times n squared absorbs one factor of n to make this into lambda, and then the other one just sits outside here. So all of these diagrams in this planar limit are a fact of order n, in fact, some of the ones I drew here are not quite. This is a little bit wrong in that this one is emitted on the other side of this line. That actually is suppressed in large n. You have to be careful which ones they are. In fact, the sort of diagrams that contribute should all come off one side and should be drawn without crossing any lines. So they're of that type. And then, of course, you can have these sort of nested ones like that. <laughs> the sum of planar diagrams. But one should be careful that they're actually planar and actually contribute. In any case, in the second order then, this correlator just becomes this thing. And you have to, the leading order in perturbation theory, you're functional of the trajectory. And you can see it's already a rather complicated looking object here. If you really wanted to take a functional derivative of it by x to figure out what the force what the reaction force on the particle is for propagating through this 
background soup, which is n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory, well, you could do it explicitly. It's not that hard, but it's already a little bit complicated. It's also non local. But we know by symmetry, and we can confirm explicitly that, first of all, this is zero when evaluated on a straight line. <coughs> Secondly, its functional derivative by x mu when evaluated on a straight line is also zero. Right? So the n equals 4 super Yang Mills theory actually doesn't back react on a straight line trajectory. Yeah, yeah. If it were really a Feynman diagram, yes. You don't have that in the Wilson loop. And that's because of the semi classical limit. You're assuming the W boson is so heavy that this propagator is just trivial. All right, so that's where the heavy particle limit comes in. The W boson doesn't uh, uh, doesn't recoil when it emits the massless gauge field and reabsorbs it. Yeah. yeah. So this so this formalism assumes that assumes that uh, the W boson doesn't recoil. So that's what's semi-classical about this. Otherwise, you might wonder what's semi-classical here. Right? It, it looks like an exact calculation, but it isn't for that reason. If you want to include the recoil, you should go and calculate the two-point function with real Feynman diagrams for all of the particles, and that will be more complicated. <coughs> okay, so our semi-classical limit is now this, dressed up with this, but we've just concluded that this dressing is trivial, that this factor actually equals n. Right, it's just a trace of one. And of course, that was uh, from our simple calculation, the result to leading order in lambda. And one could argue that next to leading orders also have that result and has been checked up to a few orders. These diagrams are all zero, but there are more complicated ones with internal vertices. And those are the things that have been checked only to a few orders. But they do seem to cancel. And it's a conjecture that well, first of all, they cancel due to supersymmetry, and that they will keep on canceling to all orders. So, so it's conjectured that this evaluate on a straight line is just equal to n. Okay. And this is from the weak coupling side. So now it's sort of instructive to go to the strong coupling side and study this problem. For example, to see what it looks like, what this expression for the propagator looks like. So what do we do on the strong coupling side? Well, on the strong coupling side, we should go over to the string theory, and we should construct that thing. And then we should figure out how to calculate a W boson propagator in that picture. Okay, well, this is still weak coupling, string theory. So this, if we worked hard, might reproduce what we're doing over there. I think it's not so simple. We need to replace this by the strong coupling limit of the string theory, which, remember, was anti-de space. And we have to figure out how to do this in anti-de Sitter space, separate one of the brains. And then we will replace the W boson by this string. It won't be a particle anymore. It will be a string. And we'll calculate a propagation amplitude. So that sounds like a tall order. There's many steps there, but we will get through it in this lecture. I, I promise you we will get to the end of it. And, and it is not that complicated at the end of the day. So how do I make this in strong coupling? Well, I replace that stack of D brains with anti-de-sitter space. 
So let me draw. I'm a terrible artist. I'm not going to make any money sitting on the street drawing things. Let me draw my anti distiller space as kind of a big box. So remember the metric of this space had a factor of L squared, this radius of curvature in front of it. Then it was dr squared over r squared. And then there's r squared dx mu squared, the metric of Minkowski, or we could say Euclidean space. And then there's the metric of the five sphere, which I'll just write like that since we don't need much of it here. All right, so that we derived last time by looking at the near horizon limit of a black D3 brain. And, all right, so that's where those low energy excitations that we identified with n equals four theory live. So now we expand this out and pretend it's the whole space. That's the trick. And then we should construct our scenario with D brains. So where do the original stack of D3 brains live here? That's not such an easy question, is there? From what I did yesterday? Uh, yes, I've probably taken the thing I had yesterday and rescaled R by some factors of L. So, so here R actually has dimensions of one over length. So I probably wrote the R I had the last time to get to here. I replaced it by R over L squared. So this has dimension of length, so does this, but this R has dimension of one over length of energy. There's, in fact, good reasons for doing that. Uh, one of them is that now R measures an energy scale rather than length scale. But uh, we won't worry about that for now. This is the metric I want to use. So this space I depict like this. Down here is R equals 0. Up here is R equals infinity. The stack of D3 brains, if you have to think of them living somewhere, it's best to think of them as living down here. Even though we will insert operators up here, in some sense they live down here. Uh, it's probably most proper to think of them as living everywhere and to think of us as having a microscope where we're sitting there looking at this and adjusting the resolution. And as we sweep over resolution from things that can resolve extremely short distances, to things that are sensitive only to longer distances, we move up and down the radius, and that down here is a deep infrared, and up here is a deep ultraviolet. And in some intuitive sense, that's why you insert point operators up here to probe the problem, because they're defined at points. So they're defined in the deep ultraviolet, and then you see their infrared effect down at the bottom. But for our purposes, it might be nice to think of the brains as living at the bottom, and the se because we have to put in the separated brain somewhere. So when you separate one brain from the stack, it will appear here as a probe brain. What do I mean by probe brain? Well, I've taken a limit here as n goes to infinity. So the original stack of brains have taken an infinite number. And then I've taken the large n limit. And in a sense, what that does is it switches off gravity, but retains the gravitational field of the stack of brains. It's like if you scaled Newton's constant to 0 and the mass of the Earth to infinity holding small g, the gravitational field in this room, a constant. And since that switches off uh, the dynamics of gravity, 
but keeps the gravitational field. So the large end limits that we've taken have basically done that for us. They've turned off fluctuating gravity, but they keep this geometry, which is the effect of the gravitational field. That means if we insert an extra brain in here, it can feel this gravitational field, but it won't produce any additional field. So we can insert it and we don't have to worry about a modification of the geometry because of its presence. And that's why it's called a probe brain. We insert it and we don't have to actually change the background, so it's like a probe of the background. It can feel the field of the background, but the background can't feel it. And remember, it was parallel to the other stack of brains, and the direction that, par that parallel means is fairly obvious here. It's in the symmetry direction where uh, the x mu's in this metric vary, but r is a constant. So we insert it at some constant radius here. So r equals r zero down, r equals zero down here, infinity up here, and we insert it at some radius, we'll call r sub zero in the middle. Now you might wonder about stability of that. Right? It's in a gravitational potential well, why doesn't it just fall down? Right? How is this a sensible state? Actually, because there's no force between D3 brains, this D3 brain will just float there. You can put it anywhere you like, it'll just stay. So I can move it here, 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 and actually the energy of this configuration doesn't depend on where I put it. So if I don't give it any velocity, if I just place it there, it'll just sit wherever I want it to sit. And you can see that dynamically. Let me outline how you can see that. I will leave the details of this uh, uh, as an exercise. I am supposed to give you some exercises, by the way. So perhaps this will be one of them. Of course, I have to find the formula in my notes. That's an exercise in itself. Okay, this D3 brain will just float there. How do I know that? Well, I can find the effect of action for a D3 brain. So that's something we haven't talked about, but it's something called Born-Infeld action. The energetics of a D3 brain uh, is encoded in the Born-Infeld action. The Born-Infeld action is something like this. It has the tension of the D3 brain, which is yet another big T, but I'll make a sub three. So this is called tension of the D3 brain. And then an integral over the world volume of the D3 brain, which here is just D4x. The x coordinates can be taken to parameterize the world volume. And then minus the square root of the metric, which here is kind of simple, of not the metric, but the determinant of the metric of the D3 brain. And actually, I'm, uh, I'm doing things with Minkowski signature here. I, well, my formulas are in Minkowski signature, so let me leave them that way to avoid mass confusion. So you should have the determinant of the metric of the D3 brain in here, which is just going to be a something simple, a constant, proportional to a constant. If you introduce gauge fields on the brain world volume, which would be these residual U1 gauge fields, the things that describe strings that begin and end, the zero modes of those strings on the brain world volume, you would add here 2 pi alpha prime times that F mu nu. So for future reference, let me write that there because sometime we might use it. So that describes the brain. Now, of course, if this were it, the brain would fall into the center. This is the part of the effective action that describes the way to the brain, and it's sitting in a gravitational potential well. And it would fall down if this were the end of the story. But there's more to it because the, this space, all of it isn't drawn here. There's also a Ramond-Ramond field excited. <laughs> 
All right, so this stack of brains down here also has a Ramond Ramon charge, and this guy is charged with respect to that field. So they're also interacting with it, just, just like it does gravitationally. And that's taken into account here by adding uh, this uh, piece from the Chern Simons term that appears in the Lagrangian of 10 dimensional type 2b supergravity. Part of it is integrated, uh, I don't know, on the phi sphere somewhere, so I'm not worried about it. And the other part is just what's called omega 4, basically the constant gauge field. And it should be added there. And it turns out that the coefficient T3 that comes out is just right for it. And this omega 4, I think I wrote it last time. Uh, I might have written it as F. I don't remember. Maybe I wrote D of it last time. So one should strip a D off to get a connection field and stick it in here. And then it turns out that if you put this field equal to 0, this and this exactly compensate each other. In other words, the Ramond Ramond repulsion of this from the stack of brains just compensates its weight and it will float wherever you put it. And that's a manifestation on the string side of the moduli on the gauge theory side where the condensate, the expectation value of phi, doesn't actually change the vacuum energy of the theory. Okay, so we can put our D3 brain floating there. Then how do we write this amplitude on this side? Well, this should be an amplitude for an open string. So the doubly boson is now this object. The fact that it's that object is why I say it's maybe in most correct to think of the stack of ND3 brains as living down here at the horizon. In fact, when we solved uh, this uh, r equals zero place does come from the horizon of the black D3 brain solution. So in a sense, the source of the gravitational field is living down there behind the horizon or just add it for this extremal solution. So the open string is something like this. Then an amplitude like this, over on this side, we would calculate using the open string sigma model. Right, it should be some amplitude in the open string sigma model. So you've been learning about things like that, how to calculate things in for open and closed strings. This sigma model is not an easy one. That's because it's a type 2b superstring theory in this background. The background has not only non-trivial geometry, it has Ramond Ramond fields excited. So it's a complicated sigma model. It is more or less known how to write it down using some coset constructions and so on. Fortunately, we won't really need that because we're just going to look at the sigma model also semi-classically. And when you look at it semi-classically, the only important part is the bosonic part. You can forget all the fermionic parts. You can forget all the details like kappa symmetry and all that stuff and, and the Ramon Ramon fields and simply write down the bosonic part of the sigma model action. And furthermore, if it's classical, it doesn't really even matter how we write it down. We can use a Nambu action if we like. We can use the Polyakov action if we like. At the classical level, these things are equivalent. So we will do whatever is simpler for us. Okay, so... Uh, So I'll erase this part, since by now you should be convinced that this brain is just floating there. It's buoyant in this background, it's not going anywhere. Uh, so let's uh, look at the sigma model for the string at the sem in the semi-classical limit. That tells us this amplitude 
is just something like e to the minus 1 over, say, 2 pi alpha prime times the area of the world sheet of the string embedded in a way that should solve some equation of motion. In fact, should extremize that area. We're not really going to solve that equation of motion. I guess we could if we wanted to. We're just going to guess the solution using symmetry. So the area should have the induced metric. I would guess the solution is something like this. Let's say our W boson is traveling in a straight line here. That means if we take the embedding function as of the string x mu, it should look something like that straight line. In fact, up here on the brain, it should look exactly like the straight line looked over there. And then the string should hang down here into the bulk, like this. So this tau parameterizes this direction, the direction of that arrow. We need a parameter for this direction. Let me call that parameter s. So there's s here, and there's tau here. So here's the beginning of the embedding of the string. I need one more parameter. Let me call the r coordinate, where, where r appears on the string world sheet, as just equal to s. OK, so s and tau are the world sheet coordinates, and the embedding coordinates are x, mu, and r. And on the 5 sphere, it should sit at a point. Why at a point? Well, I've separated this from the stack of D3 brains. Remember, if we suppress the dimensions of the D3 brains from the 10-dimensional point of view, they just look like a point charge in six dimensions. But now I've taken a whole pile of point charges, and I've taken one of them and separated it. So it has to go some direction in this six-dimensional space. That direction is parameterized by a point on the phi sphere. And of course, the distance is equal to this radius, actually. So it sits at a point on the phi sphere. So uh, these phi sphere coordinates, which we, I guess we called xm last time, I would write a magnitude as r, and then it should have some unit vector on the phi sphere, which I'll call theta hat m. And actually, here we've uh, chosen that direction, I guess, by our condensate was five, five, six. So in some sense, this one is actually in the six, in direction number six. It doesn't really matter because the rotation invariance can be used to put it in any direction, but uh, to match with what we talked about over on the gauge theory side, where one phi condensed, phi six, this unit vector should be in the sixth direction. OK, so there's our embedding of the string. All we have to do is calculate the area of the world sheet. And we'll do it in the simplest possible way, just from the Nambu action, which means calculate the induced metric, find as determinant, and integrate it over the world sheet. OK, so the induced metric. Here we deduce from this thing, I'll call it d sigma squared. It has this L squared in front of it that it inherits from the ADS metric. Then there's dr squared over r squared. That's just ds squared over s squared. And then there's plus s squared times dx mu dx mu, which is just this stuff x final minus x initial squared over the proper time squared times d tau squared. 
So there's your induced metric. Please inspect these formulas carefully in case I make misprints or less politely called mistakes. Uh, I, I think that's okay for an induced metric. So root of the induced metric is just the product of these. There's an L squared in front because you get L squared for each of them. S squared and 1 over S squared cancel each other. And then you just get uh, 1 over the total time times square root of x final minus x initial squared. In the six-dimensional transverse space, it is actually the same R. Though this piece is just the metric of the unit sphere. Yeah. Okay. So that means it's just basically zero. The, it doesn't extend in that direction. So root g is a constant. The area is, uh, well, 1 over 2 pi alpha prime times the area is L squared. Remember, it was root lambda alpha prime over 2 pi alpha prime. And then we have this stuff, integrated d tau from 0 to tau p. And integrated ds, well, from 0 to r0. And then this constant integrand, 1 over tau p, times the square root of x final minus x initial squared. And what you get here is root lambda over 2 pi. The alpha primes cancel out. So it's really nice. The things that are intrinsically stringy kind of go away. If they didn't go away, it would be hard to identify this with something on the gauge theory side. But in these calculations, uh, if you're doing things right, they always go away. So alpha prime went away. Total proper time went away. You get a factor of R0, the height of the brain in ADS. And then this other expression of the Euclidean distance which is basically the proper time restoring itself. And the amplitude should be e to the minus this. L squared. So remember the radius of ADS was related to lambda? L squared is root lambda alpha prime so it's part of our dictionary okay so what do I get I get that this amplitude is e to the minus that thing, root lambda over 2 pi r0 times x final minus x initial squared. Now we can go back and compare this with our gauge theory calculation. So this is string field theory, weak coupling. It was e to the minus the mass times this. There was an n here from the Wilson loop. Over here, maybe this world sheet is a disk. Sort of like a disk. In that case, there would be a factor of g string to the Euler number of the disk, which would be or minus the Euler number of the disk, and that would also give an n. So the n would 
reproduce itself, arguably. And the rest of this uh, stuff, well, the form is more or less the same. The dependence on this stuff is the same. It is if you identify the mass of the Dudley boson this way. And that is just the length from here to here times the string tension. So that's very reasonably the semi-classical value of the mass. And since the Wilson loop was apparently one, and here this is absolutely consistent with that because this calculation should contain, on this side, should contain the Wilson loop in it. And the Wilson loop doesn't depend on the mass, so it can't be absorbed into this bit, in a sense. It would have to be a factor here. It looks like on this side the Wilson expectation value of the Wilson loop is also 1. Okay, so this sigma model calculation gives you this propagator and seems to reproduce the gauge theory one when you identify the mass of the particle in just the obvious way. Okay. So that's the preparation for a more sophisticated calculation. Do I only have five minutes left for my sophisticated calculation? <laughs> okay, my sophisticated calculation is going to spill over into the afternoon. But let me give you a teaser. What's a teaser? You know, the thing at the beginning of the television show that shows how interesting it's going to be. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Let's elaborate this a little bit, because there is a famous calculation in this business of the circle Wilson loop. And the circle Wilson loop is non-trivial, unlike the straight line. So can I use this kind of physical context to extract the circle Wilson loop? Well, the answer is clearly yes, or I wouldn't bother talking about it. Uh, and so that's what I would like to do. But before I do that, maybe I'll use the last few minutes of my time here to just tell you how Maldacena told us to calculate the circle Wilson loop. So what I will do is basically a derivation of that. But let me just give his prescription. So what he said is I should come here. And I don't bother with the suspended brain. Well, I do bother with it, but uh, he doesn't discuss it at all. He just pushes it off to the boundary at infinity. He says, come up here, and whatever Wilson loop you like, you draw it on the boundary at infinity. So there's the curve. And then you uh, fill in the curve with a disk, and you let that disk hang into the space. And then the area of the disk, well, what you do is you extremize the disk. You extremize its area, so you find the disk of minimal area. You calculate that minimal area, and you plug it into this formula. And that's his formula for the Wilson loop. And then, of course, the straight line Wilson, well, that's not quite the end of the story. In fact, there's a complication there. Because this area is always infinite. Even for a closed curve, it's always infinite. So you have to subtract the infinity. And so he has a way of subtracting the infinity. In some sense, it's linearly divergent. How is it linearly divergent? Well, if you pull this down a little bit from the boundary, it becomes finite. So there's always like an infinitely long neck of this disk near the boundary, which has linearly divergent area. And so if you subtract the area of that neck, that regulates this and you get a finite result. The area of that neck, he said, was just the area 
of a cylinder that hangs all the way to the horizon that all the way down has the same shape as this curve C. In a sense, that's subtracting the mass of the W boson that we've already calculated over here. So if the amplitude gives you e to the minus mass times the length of the curve in leading order, and then times the expectation value of the Wilson loop, his subtraction is just canceling that first factor, e to the minus mass times the, the length. If you do that, the circle will turn out to be, well, if you do that, his prescription for the straight line gives just one. So kind of in line with our expectation from perturbation theory that the straight line Wilson loop is trivial here. It doesn't get corrections. And this is on the strong coupling side, so all corrections should be included in that, at least at the planar level. And then his prediction for the circle Wilson loop Of course, this is an expectation value in a conformal field theory. And the size of the circle is the only dimensionful parameter there. Right? The W boson mass has been taken to infinity, so it's out of the picture, in a sense, in his calculation. And so the calculation can't actually depend on any dimensionful parameters. And he just gets e to the square root lambda. In the afternoon, I would like to show you how to get this starting from this point of view where we first take a particle we force it to go in a circle by putting a magnetic field on it so it follows a cyclotron orbit we calculate the amplitude for it to cycle around the cyclotron orbit once on the particle side and then we calculate it on the string side and compare the two and from that we can deduce the circle wilson loop and of course we will find something that agrees with him and there'll be some more discussion surrounding it, which I hope will be interesting. So thank you.